name's Mark Perman. I'm the uh, Joint Secretary. Bob Stanton, who you've been, uh, who's just been talking, he and I share the secretary duties for the West Midlands branch because it's just too much for one for one person. So pretty obvious what we're doing today. Um, Gerber, who we've had uh, talks from in the past, gives an excellent uh, uh, talk. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this. And then there'll be questions and answers. Gerber, you're now the host. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen. And you should be able to see that now. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Hey, well, listen, thank you for so many of you joining in. It's great to see some familiar names that I haven't seen for a while and some names of, of people I've never met at all. Uh, got people from Rome, Switzerland, India, of course, and I'm particularly grateful that uh, we've got Silin uh, Mas uh, Laxman, Pradeep Jain, and Ramun Sunavasa. These are individuals who helped me with some of the research and also great, great to see Barrett and Ken here in the UK. And Ken, I'm quite happy for you to send me the invoice for the data that you're paying for. Ken's the only one, I think, who's using his mobile to, to dial in here. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do is uh, uh, just share with you an answer to a question that most of you probably haven't seen. So I was going to forget almost, but I uh, remember only about half an hour ago. So you may not have seen this. Um, you should see this. Next slide. Um, I asked the question online. Um, I said, in PE Cleta was the driving force in establishing the BIS in 1933, but he had a lot of other interests too. And he left a meeting uh, uh, on one occasion and he went to either a watch wrestling, football, a Shakespearean play, or a choir. Most of you on this call probably think, who the hell is PE Cleta? Um, so I wasn't going not, not going to give you an option to give me an answer. Those of you who are familiar with uh, PE Cleta and the history of the BIS uh, may be interested to know that the answer is all in wrestling. I was really surprised to find that out. And it's in a document that you see extracts from on the right. And I'll tell you more about that document and the person who wrote it, another individual from the early days of the BIS, a guy called Leslie Johnson. So I wanted to get that out of the way before I forgot. The other thing I want to do um, is just share with you this screen. Uh, what you can see on the left is um, a, uh, uh, a report from a BIS publication in 1935. Um, for some of you, you might recognize his name, names, Professor Nicholas Renin, or Frederick Schmiedel, or indeed P.E. Kleta. And Stephen H. Smith is in that same page in that particular publication in 1935. The significance of that is that um, Stephen Smith, although most people have never heard of him, uh, he was known at that time. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is at the bottom of that page, you see this reference to... Um, members are reminded that society note paper may be obtained from the Honourable Secretary for two shillings and sixpence. Well, this is a note paper, and this is a note paper that Stephen Smith did use in India, uh, who's based in Calcutta. I'll talk more about him in a second. Um, and what's interesting is uh, Arthur C. Clarke who was also a member in the 1930s, who was a teenager at the time, he sent a, a message to uh, Leslie Johnson saying, no, I'm not going to buy any of these because so even as a teenager, Arthur C. Clarke was a prolific writer. And that I thought was a really interesting anecdote going back to the days when he was uh, a teenager, still writing so much uh, in, in the 1930s before he got all his uh, fame and writing novels and, and, and films. So um, now I'm supposed to have done this in a very slick and uh, smooth manner, you know, like in James Bond, John, James Bond films where they show you the, the opening dramatic scene and then the screen, this, the introduction. Well, 
that, that was my version of it. <laughs> and uh, so this is my uh, introduction. So just to repeat, I do write um, uh, pay, uh, news, uh, articles, um, books, and, and, and uh, on my own podcast. If you want to contact me, there's the details. The companies that I've worked for in the past, Fujitsu and Talus, and some of the books that I've been writing. And this on the right-hand side is the one that I'm focusing on today. So um, what I'm going to do is try to stretch as much out of this hour or so I as I can. Um, I'm going to talk about Stephen Smith's this life, his research and uh, my research in writing a book about him, and Stephen Smith's Leslie Johnson and the BIS, the connection between Stephen Smith and the BIS, and then finish off with the legacy or what I think is a legacy. Um, what you see on the right is a picture, one of the best pictures I came across of Stephen Smith. He's the guy on the, sitting on the floor on the bottom left-hand side. This is in Calcutta. Uh, and the picture below is a picture of one of his rockets. And if you think you can see a, a bird pop, popping its head outside at the top, you're right. There is a bird at the top. Um, if you look carefully, and I will share these slides if anybody wants them, you can see that behind this picture, this, this almost a tripod, is the rack, this one here, that he used to launch his rockets from. That's the kind of work he's doing. It's a, like a big tripod. The rocket he's using are about that size, made initially from cardboard, later from wood and even aluminium. Um, but initially, they're very small. The largest one he ever did was about uh, two meters in size. So it's very small. And with the exception of a couple of rockets right near the end of his rocket experimenting activities, they all used solid fuel. Uh, uh, the, in 1944, he did, he says he used uh, compressed air and gas to propel his rockets. Not much around in the way of technical details for that, but uh, that's the kind of picture, the context of his rockets. So as you can see, I've stretched this out quite a lot. Um, if you are interested in it from a, a philatelic point of view or a, a history or about rockets, you will be disappointed um, because I will not go into of those areas. I won't have time, but you will all be disappointed equally, I hope. So it's democratic at least. Um, so very briefly then, um, his life, uh, he was born in Assam, northeastern India, in 1891. Uh, so when he was um, starting his school, we had the Wright brothers to launch uh, with their very first aeroplanes. When uh, he was leaving school uh, in 1911, he, there was a very historic event, very familiar with the, uh, for the philatelic community. It was the first time that uh, aeroplanes were used officially to carry mail. The concept of airmail was born in Ahmedabad in India in 1911. It's very close to the school, reasonably, India is a huge place, to where Smith was just about to leave school. <coughs> and I think those two things played a, an important role in getting his interest in aeroplanes and airmail and eventually rockets. Work-wise, he worked as a customs official in Calcutta, although um, the, the port was way inside, a bit like we have here in Manchester. Manchester has a docks. Uh, the river Hooghly goes quite a way in, 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 uh, inland. Uh, so he worked as a customs official and a policeman and a dentist. But I think later in, in life, most of his income was primarily from um, generating, uh, selling, uh, and dealing in covers or flown covers, letters and postcards and rocket mail. And during his lifetime, he did about, um, all, about 300 rocket mail experiments um, and did them between 1934 and 1944, although the details of his experiments in 1944 and indeed throughout the World War II period, he didn't publish until 1945 and afterwards. So what this book uh, does, I think, is this my new book is highlight the numerous international contacts that Smith had, and many of those were people who were 
the leading players in rocket mails and rocketry itself indeed. So that uh, is what I'm going to be talking about uh, in, in the next few moments as well. But also remember that it was in the 1930s, that, uh, uh, 1930s and 40s, that India itself was going through a tremendous period of change. Not only was the um, rise, uh, the movement against uh, for independence in India, this is British India times days, um, but there was the um, famine in the Calcutta and Bengal area where Smith lived, the um, World War II itself, a lot of American forces were based there, Japanese attacked the harbour in Japanese Air Force, attacked the harbour in, in Calcutta, and Smith would have heard that, he was very close to that. And he would have um, uh, been um, part of the uh, in the post-independence uh, riots and the partition that took place. And during this period, Smith himself was, no doubt due to the privations of the time, was ill for pretty much about the last decade of his life. He died in 1951. And I must say also, uh, not least because I have some philatelists on, on the recorded uh, a lot of the work that Smith um, A lot of the uh, personal effects of Smith were on sale two years after he died in uh, Florida and the West Coast in California which shows you how much of an international uh, person he was, and he had this interest everywhere. The cover on the top right is one of the covers that uh, he flew in 1944, and, uh, or in the 1940s, beg your pardon. And if you've got 20,000 euros, you can have one of them. There weren't, weren't very many. Um, the point is, even today, um, you know, uh, 80 years on, it, what he's selling, uh, or, or what collectors are still collecting his um, material. So that's from a catalog that was published two years ago. On the bottom right hand corner, I just want to make the connection between Stephen Smith and space. In his time, he never spoke about space. He never wrote about space, but people after him did. And this is a piece written in 1960. I'd like now to just uh, show you very quickly, um, if you go, I'm going to be sharing these slides with you. I did have a, a live demo to show you this, but I won't go there now. Um, if um, um, you want to have a look at the very first writing I wrote about Stephen Smith in 2014, there's a link here. I'll share these links at the end. And if you want to buy any of these books, do use this code, but it's available on this link. And if you go to this link, you'll go to see the contents inside the book, as well as having a listen and uh, listen to some audio that I recorded on a podcast episode where I was a guest, along with some book reviews. I'd now like to move on to tell you a little bit about how I went about the research. And I'm going to skip through this very, very quickly. Um, the sources came from Sikkim. Some of you might be wondering, where the heck is Sikkim? Well, it's in the top northeast part of uh, India. Um, it became formally a part of India in 1976. And why that's important is because Stephen Smith in 1935 went to Sikkim twice uh, to do his rocket experiments. And Sikkim is a bit like um, the Lake District, if you ever go uh, in the UK, it's very undulating land, and this is Gangtok, uh, capital of uh, Sikkim. And if you can see, it's on multiple levels, a beautiful place. And I looked in the archives there, and in the archives there, I came across a document that uh, the state archives now hold, but it's the communications between the king of Sikkim that uh, Stephen Smith needed permission from, and there's a lot of documents there, a lot of uh, uh, information. So this is still there, and uh, um, that provided some details about who he was contacting, when, and uh, what he had to do. This is the, the days of the British administration, so it wasn't a clear cut. The other place I want to mention 
is uh, uh, Basel and Bern in uh, Switzerland. I did some research and communicated with the archivist and I assumed that uh, there would be some information I needed to see. When it turned up, there's, there's so much. I thought a couple of days would do it. In the end, all five days that I had, I had to look through there. And a lot of the details that you'll see, uh, I'll share with you today, and are in the book, are in this correspondence. And this is the archive of a Dr. Robert Paganini, who I will talk about uh, briefly uh, in a moment. In addition, um, I've got uh, Liverpool, and I'm glad to say, uh, and so Liverpool, I'll come back to Liverpool in a moment, and also the London Museum, uh, London Postal Museum. And I'll just share with you because of uh, um, oh, two things actually. One of the things I found was Stephen Smith is trying to get some money <laughs> from the MPs in uh, London. He was a British citizen, as indeed all Indians were at the time. And he contacted an MP who, uh, whose niece lived in, in Calcutta. So he's trying to get some money, as all newly started organizations tend to do. In 1958, it was the 21st, uh, 25th anniversary of the BIS. And Les Carter sent a letter to the um, Postmaster General saying, hey, can we have a special postmark to recognize this? He said no, but it was quite interesting to see this. And one other thing which I just want to share with you. Um, I said Liverpool. This is a collection that I found in um, uh, Liverpool. Liverpool is where Leslie Johnson was living in 1934. And uh, because he was the secretary of the BIS, he got the correspondence from anybody who was inter interested in the BIS. And there's a lot of uh, documents that I found. And indeed, there's a file with Stephen Smith's correspondence in there. And uh, I was very grateful that uh, Les Johnson's daughter, Pam Reed, was, uh, had allowed me to have a look through that. And I'm delighted to say that Pam is on the meeting with us. Uh, if you do want to say anything or share some comments, Pam, feel free to add them to the comments and maybe do a Q&A Q &A session, um, make a contribution, or feel free to interrupt at any time. Okay, um, so the last place uh, was Washington DC, the Smithsonian Museum. This is purely by chance because the IAC was taking place in Washington last year and I happened to be there, but they had tons of information about him. So I'm mindful that I want to keep uh, to my time. So uh, I'm going to finish at about quarter two, another 15 minutes or so, and then we can have a Q&A. The person um, I was, whose archive you saw in that big collection of uh, box files was a Dr. Robert Paganini. Um, and Stephen Smith was in contact with him. Willie Lay, a German rocket um, engineer, was also in contact with him. So was Leslie Johnson. Leslie Johnson on behalf of the BIS, of course. Friedrich Schmiedel, I was a, a, an Austrian rocket mail experimenter. Indeed, he was the very first to introduce this concept of rocket mail uh, in 1931. And there's another guy called Max Kronstein, who uh, was German original, originally. He, was, he fought during the Battle of the Somme uh, in the First World War, was taken a prisoner, came to England for a while, to the Netherlands, and went back to Germany, and then in 1939 ended up in, uh, in New York. Uh, so he had a lot of languages, and he had, uh, uh, wrote a great deal about Stephen Smith. And uh, uh, he, Stephen Smith, had pictures of Robert Paganini and Max Kronstein in his house. Uh, and he quite share, share those uh, pictures with all his visitors who came by. Um, just want to again show the parallel uh, timing wise. Again, some of these names may not be familiar with many of you here, but um, if you look, you've got um, Paganini, he was about 20 years older than Smith, Robert Goddard, Stephen Smith, Herman Orbach, 
and Friedrich Schmiedl and Sergei Kraliev, Gerhard Zucker, and Werner von Braun. These are all people who in the 1930s were experimenting with rockets. And although Smith never achieved anything compared with many of the names that you'll see there, he was their contemporary and he was trying to achieve something in his own way, working alone, unsupported and unfunded in India. Two things I want to talk about next. One is airships and rockets, uh, rocket mail. Both things outdated now, but think back into 1930s time. This today, if you want to be building anything in the uh, leading field of science and technology in terms of transport or space, you might have startups in who are building rocket engines or trying to build um, satellites themselves, CubeSats, uh, or build satellites which uh, build mechanisms which will allow you to build satellites in space or build some AI-based algorithms which can keep distances uh, between satellites automatically in Earth orbit um, or, or indeed build, build mechanisms to refuel or service satellites in space. That's what you would do today. In the 1930s, the leading edge technology was airships and rocket mail. So Stephen Smith was doing what was leading edge at the time. So um, on the, going through the bullet points then, Stephen Smith got into this through um, philately and he established the, rocket M the Indian Airmail Society in 1924. He invited Robert Paganini based in Switzerland, who was well known by that time, to join as an honorary member, he did, and that started a, a journey uh, of correspondence that lasted for 25 years. Smith was also a member of philatelic societies around the UK, Europe, and USA, and he joined the BIS in late 1934, just after uh, the year after the BIS was founded here in the, uh, in the UK. Um, so he produced, collected, and dealt in um, mail covers, um, <clears throat> first day covers. He even sold co covers that were flown for the first time around the, the summit of Mount Everest. He wrote five books, he produced eight more, but never published them. And his personal collection is now distributed right around the world. The two pictures you see at the right uh, are uh, on the top, it's a picture of the airship that was built in, 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 in the UK, in England, in the late 1920s. And in 1931, this is the R101 that was uh, one of two built um, about that time. It left uh, England on the 3rd of, uh, sorry, on the 4th of October 1931, I think that's correct, uh, to go to India. It never made it. It crashed and uh, uh, that was le what was left of it uh, on the following day in France. Sadly, a lot more people died on that compared to the Hindenburg, but because the Hindenburg has that uh, footage, not ma many more people knew about that at the time. And it was that um, crash and it killed a lot of the engineers and the politicians who were driving the project of airships in England that the airship industry pretty much came to an end uh, as a result. On the bottom right-hand corner is the airship uh, hangar. It's in Karachi, and uh, about 10, 18 miles outside Karachi in India. And this is huge. If you look carefully, um, you will see this building here, that's the sort of scale of the buildings that we're familiar with. This will have, can have the football fields of uh, Liverpool and Manchester United end-to-end -end inside it. I think of this as the vehicle assembly building of the day. Although R101 was uh, heading for that, never made it, that building was never used. Okay, if I move on to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> rocket mail. Again, may sound an odd thing for us to, to, to think about today, but in the 1930s, it was a big, uh, big deal. 
Willie Lay, uh, who was one of the earlier founder members of the Verein for Raumschifffahrt, who was the BIS equivalent of, uh, of Germany, or rather the BIS was the equivalent of the VFR in Berlin, um, he came to Liverpool. And this picture at the bottom left-hand corner, this is a picture of uh, Willie Lay, this guy here with his spectacles. He's in Liverpool in uh, February of 1935. And uh, he's talking about landing people on the moon and rockets for postal use. And here on the right-hand side is President Eisenhower, who was receiving mail <laughs> that was posted by cruise missile. A cruise missile carrying post was launched from uh, off the coast of Florida. It uh, landed, it was uncrewed, on the runway. And this is a, a post, uh, a, a letter on that cruise missile. And at that time, uh, this is now 1959, uh, people thought, yeah, we're going to be having missile mail right around the world. Didn't quite happen, but that's the... Uh, time that Smith was working in. just want to talk about uh, a few people very briefly. Um, Robert Paganini is the most central character, as you saw from that picture. He was in the center of everything. But he was something special for Stephen Smith. Uh, he was a chemical engineer, uh, so he was just a couple of decades older than uh, Smith, and he compiled the very first airmail catalogue in Switzerland in 1912, and very highly regarded in, uh, uh, in uh, Switzerland. So in, 20, in, the last, in the second quarter of, 19, uh, of, the 18th, uh, of the 20th century, between 1925 and 1950, Smith and Paganini sent each other letters. It's those letters that I saw in that museum which allowed me to tell the story in Smith's own words. Um, and they built up a very special relationship which was really unique, um, bearing in mind that they never met uh, and they never spoke to each other, as far as I can tell. Uh, that when S Paganini died in 1950, he left a quarter of his will to Smith. And sadly, Smith died three months later in February 1951. So personally, he probably didn't benefit it directly himself. Max Kronstein um, was uh, somebody who was known to Paganini. And he also, he learned about Smith's work from Paganini, but he kept writing about what Smith was doing uh, in America in particular. So he provided one of the quotes that I use in my book, that uh, Smith was the greatest one-man campaign for rocketry. Uh, Friedrich Schmiedel, who was based in Austria, uh, he um, was seen as the, uh, someone who'd established rocket mail at the very beginning. Technically, very competent individual. And Smith and uh, Schmiedel did communicate. I saw letters in um, uh, both the uh, museum in Bern and the uh, Smithsonian, where they uh, um, refer to each other's work. He was complaining that he was putting a lot of time and effort, but he wasn't really getting the support, which is exactly what was the fate of... Leslie Johnson, uh, was a founder, fellow, and a treasurer, and uh, a secretary, and vice president. He was the point of contact for Smith. And in one letter, and this is very rare, most of the letters I came across were from Smith. This is a, a little bit of a, 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 a caption from a letter from August 1938, where um, Smith is writing to uh, Johnson saying, um, there's this company called the Keystone Press Agency who've contacted him um, in Calcutta, but he's saying to Johnson, he said, well, can you supply this press agency some information about me? So he was getting some recognition internationally, and uh, Johnson was saying, yes, I'll provide any information to the 
press agency if they ask for me, no problem with that. So there's a sense of mutual support between the various contacts. And in the same letter, Smith tells Johnson about this uh, uh, family, the Sir David and Lady Ezra, who live in Calcutta, who are members of the Indian Airmail Society, who are familiar with uh, the work that Smith is doing in Calcutta. And he's saying, oh, um, by the way, these fairly rich people are coming to London for uh, uh, the summer of 1938. And it may be interesting for you to see if you can approach them to get some support. <laughs> Remember, in the early, early days, any organization, particularly one that's run by grassroots and membership subscription, they struggle financially. So any sponsorship is welcome. In the end, I don't think Sir David Ezra helped BIS, but later on, uh, when um, um, other people came in, I think it's the Nuffield Institute and um, uh, Professor A. M. Lowe, who joined the BIS, he had contacts within the Nuffield, uh, Lord Nuffield and uh, A. V. Rowe, who he said he might approach to get the support. But this is an example of Smith trying to help the BIS in his own way. And the last thing I want to mention on here, so Smith was testing rockets to transport mail, food, medicines and even livestock and this idea of using rockets to transport anything else is something that Leslie Johnson wrote about in a, in, a, in a science fiction story that he called Satellites of Death where he used, I'm guessing, the idea of using rockets as a mechanism for transporting as a plot in a murder mystery based in, uh, in, in, in Liverpool. Uh, it's called Satellites of Death um, Pam was kind enough to let me have a copy of the book that is published. I have scanned it in. It is quite old. Uh, if anybody's interested in having a look at that, feel free to get in touch. Um, oh, that's gone. So, the last thing I want to share with you, uh, coming up to quarter two. So, <clears throat> you've seen that slide. In my book, I have a lot of references. And one of the references refers to something called the unpublished manuscript by Leslie Johnson. And he wrote, wrote about the Les, uh, experience, his experience being the BIS uh, secretary, along with many other roles, during 1933 and 1938 in particular. And um, Pam showed me this document. Pam, in, in fact, was quite uh, kind enough to join us in the in 2013, I think it was, uh, when we had the 80th anniversary of the BIS, and she spoke about this manuscript, manuscript then. And when I saw that, I thought, well, this should be published. And uh, so Pam and I are working on producing this uh, publication. So the book you see on the right doesn't exist yet. It's uh, this title, it's a working title, and it's essentially a way of uh, uh, publishing this manuscript that uh, Leslie Johnson produced, and he didn't quite get to publish it. He died in 1982. I think if he had lived a bit longer, he would have published it. On the, on the left-hand side, you see what uh, it contains. It's a summary of each of the um, uh, years that he was directly involved before the BIS moved to uh, London in 1938. Full of fascinating tidbits. We're working on that. So I just thought I'd mention that in terms of a closure, but I do want to end up with this final, final message. And this, I guess, is in what I would conclude as, as a legacy. Um, in practice, Stephen Smith, um, you know, he does have papers published, uh, or his work appears in NASA documents, he's in museums around the world. India did commemorate his centenary uh, of his birth and pub uh, issued a stamp. Uh, he's uh, recognized for uh, within the philatelic community, but through my book, I hope to a wider audience. This picture you see is the first meeting of the International Astronautical Congress. 
It's the first meeting in 1950, and it's a, uh, IAC is the, started then and is continuing, and I, that was a meeting that I attended in Washington, D.C. in October last year. It holds what is probably the premier uh, conference, uh, it's a week-long conference at least, uh, every year in a different city around the world, and it started in 1950, and it's been going every, every year, every year since this year it's going to be online uh, but uh, it's been a, it's a, it's a core event where countries around the world get together and where the international collaboration space takes place why am i telling you this well the bis was a founder member of this particular event and the um, other men guy i mentioned friedrich schmiedel was present at this meeting in 1950. Had Stephen Smith got some more support, maybe from the government, uh, he would perhaps uh, have been able to establish the Indian uh, Interplanetary Society or something like that, and then pushed along the progress of the Indian Space Program, uh, which would have been a bit more accelerated and more advanced by now than it is. So, I think um, if I conclude with the, what I think I've mentioned so far, uh, Smith, Stephen Smith failed to attract the support financially, politically, or technical. He learned, he worked alone for most of his uh, life. Um, the civil unrest and the difficulty he lived through made it very difficult for the work he was doing to be available in the public domain. He did try to engage engineers, uh, it's a guy called Victor Pont, whose name I came across only early this year, just, or just before going to press with this book. Uh, but uh, he had left India and he couldn't con uh, contribute. So it, just like um, Schmiedel, I think Smith himself didn't feel he got the support and therefore didn't really um, have the bigger um, uh, vision, or rather, the bigger visibility that he deserved. Okay, Bob, I'll hand over back to you and some questions. Robert, thank you very much indeed. That was a great talk. I thoroughly enjoyed that. When I see we actually have somebody else trying to join. My goodness. Uh, okay, everyone, I'm going to uh, unmute you. And um, just be just be cognizant that it can be very noisy if we all speak at once. But uh, we're now ready for um, we're now ready for questions. Ooh. Hi, this is Ange in um, Greenford with Nigel. Um, thank you for a talk. I was looking forward to that one uh, because my background, uh, my family are from India. Um, I was just one. I was just wondering about um, trial and errors in the first place, because as um, just a, I, I'm not, I have no background in space or rocket technology, um, so my curiosity is mainly like thinking. Well, the first rocket which goes up, um, it's going to explode. Mm -hmm. so I see rockets which explode, and would the mail go everywhere, or was it pioneered or created in such a way where a uh, section would? Um, disconnect and it would have a parachute how was that done <laughs> the very first uh, rocket uh, attempt by stephen smith was from a ship uh, on the hoogly river to an island and exactly what you say happened it blew up and all the letters <laughs> ended up in the river uh, this was quite common um, so in the early days it, this is why they, they have to experiment mostly the the propellant that was the problem um the gerhard zucker is another guy i mentioned he was a german he did his experiments in in england and in scotland as well and he used bigger rockets with larger numbers of uh, covers and his rockets exploded also spectacularly and as a result um uh, rocket mail in the early days did not have a good reputation so 
this certainly true from the early 1930s, but as the years advanced, they became much more reliable. And it was the developments in the rocket propellant that uh, was really the key there. But later on, um, and this is true for Schmiedel and uh, um, others as well, they did develop multi-stage rockets. And Schmiedel in particular, and I have some pictures in, in the book, where he would recover his um, uh, mail um, payload by parachute, um, okay. which worked very successfully. Um, Smith says at one stage that he tried parachutes and he was against them. Um, it's quite a tiff tough thing to do, especially in the early days. Um, but what Smith was focusing on, this is why he had uh, so many experiments with uh, fins and rudders and tailplanes, was he would like to get the rocket that he launched to land in the place where he wanted. Um, it was technically quite a challenge, in the, I think pretty much beyond him, but he liked the idea that you, could, uh, you should know where your payload is going to land. And the parachute was coming down in wind, it's very difficult to control. So although his thinking was correct, technically he wasn't able to uh, design and implement the aerofoils he needed. Uh, because he built something he called the boomerang rocket or the rocket train uh, or multi-stage rockets. Uh, but he, he never really quite got there. And indeed, Schmiedel himself didn't. Uh, Schmiedel tried to launch a, a multi-stage rocket with a camera on board to take pictures. Uh, I think he was more successful, but I've not seen any pictures taken from camera from high up above that uh, were launched there by his rockets. Um, okay, but, very interesting. Um, well, do, you think, do you think, just finally, do you think mm -hmm. um, because of the land mass geographically of India being so huge uh, and vast, mm -hmm. though it was during the time of the Raj, as you said, mm -hmm. um, his his interest came from the fact of rockets or of trying to deliver mail or goods or items in a more efficient way in comparison to the train system, which was reliable, obviously. Yeah, um, I, I think, and I try to allude this to some speculating here. If you think about what kids do right now, um, if you talk about rockets and space shuttle and astronauts and satellites, they're automatically interested. It's the leading edge technology, just as at one stage steam engines were. You know, people used to look, go out to watch trains go by. And in the early days of aeroplanes, people would, if there was an airplane flying past, you would go out to look at them. It's just new technology. So I think the, um, in part, the answer is that um, uh, it was just the fact that it was new technology. It was quite a young, Yish man at the time, and he was intrigued, and that's what was available to have to him in his era. Hi, Gurbir. So, so, just one more thing on that. I'll carry on in a second. Um, in India, uh, the idea of the monsoons, floods, earthquakes, he developed the rockets to transport his rocket, uh, his mail. Uh, but then he, he writes, and I've got a quote uh, which I'll show you later. He says, in fact, um, that food and medicines are more important at times of emergency than mail. So he was trying to expand the, the, the range of things that his rockets would transport. That, that's, so, good, sorry, really good to hear. that's really good to hear because um, it really shows that he was a pioneer at the time mm. and thinking really forward. Thank you very much and appreciate Thank that. Yeah. Hi, Gurubir. May I ask a question now? Sure, please. Nice to see you, Mark. And Hi. Uh, I was going through your presentation and uh, I noticed two things. Number mm -hmm. one, 25th June 1940, you have displayed a cover in the presentation where, mm -hmm. you, where you are saying that it is a cover worth 20,000 euro catalog. Is it correct? Mm -hmm. That's okay. from uh, what? That's from Walter Hofweiser's catalogue that he published in uh, two years ago. Uh, I have in my hand. Um, I think it's the one more recent than that, isn't it? Okay, no, this is the one in the German version, and there is one oh, more okay. in the yeah. English version. And uh, may I know, uh, are you the host or who is the organizer of the event? I'm sorry, I'm not aware with it. 
so I can request uh, for the permission to share my screen to make a comment on on that particular cover, please. Uh, yes, okay, let's do that. Uh, let me find you. Uh, okay, so actually, when you click the security button, then you will be able to allow the screen sharing option to me. Okay, I'm doing, I think I'm doing that. No problem. Multiple tech participants can share. Oh yes, I can share now. Okay. okay, so let me open the cover on the screen first, because I think there is some confusion which we all need to discuss regarding this. So this is the page you are talking about, correct, Gurbir? Uh, looks right, but as I say, I have the English version. Yep, carry on. And anyway, I, we are not going to discuss the text. We are just going to discuss the date that you have shown this cover, right, on the top right one. Yeah. If you make your point, uh, I'm fine. I'm very happy with whatever, whatever clarification you have there, Markand. Yeah. So what I want to say that this cover, which you are saying 20,000 euro catalog, which is written here, right? And here. It is, it is not the picture of, of this two 20,000 euro covers. This is rocket number 22A, which is written here. Can you see where I'm putting my cursor? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. yep. And you, can you read the date? I'm pointing my cursor again. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is 25th June 1940 and it is catalog only 400 euros and it is a picture 25 June 1940 on the right side. It's, this is a 400 euro worth cover and not, ah. and not the 20,000 euro worth cover. Ah, however, I understand. however, Michael Hopfenweiser who has published this book is a very dear friend of mine and what he is trying to tell here that these covers are 17th July 1940. Okay, so 17th July was just yesterday. So <laughs> he's uh, taking back us in the history uh, nearly eight years. And these two are the rocket number 230 and 231. And these two are only one known example of each. And these two covers worth. 20,000 euros as each. Right. I, I hope uh, uh, you are able to understand what I'm trying to. I, I, I do. And I just, just say uh, that uh, this is the kind of detail that the philatelic community really goes into. <laughs> and I I'm really appreciate that. Thank you very much. I'm always Thank happy you. to share, Gurbir. You know that we discuss this a lot. Okay, the second question, which. Uh, I don't have uh, enough information and I need your help. So I'm not sure when you are writing Dr. Max Kronstein mm -hmm. and, and the label what Stephen Smith has prepared as a rocket number 164 and it says Mariana Kronstein. So mm -hmm. what is the controversy of the Max and Mariana? Is the Mariana is the wife of Max Kronstein? His daughter. His daughter. Excellent. Thank you. Super. Super. No problem. And, uh, okay, I, I don't know. I lost my screen setting. But anyway, I was going to show another two picture very quickly. Okay. And if you don't. Yes, you should be able to do that again then. I'm sorry, but there are two very interesting covers and uh, Gurbir will appreciate it. So, Gurbir, see. These are the only two known rocket males, okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is one of them. You can see number one is here. One out of the two. Rocket 260. And this is the two out of the two. And these are being displayed for the first time. Nobody has seen in 79 years so far. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, these are being displayed for the first time. And uh, I will stop my screen sharing. And uh, the price of that two rocket males, 260, which uh, unfortunately, again, uh, Michael Hopfenweiser doesn't have a picture of 260. Price of the uh, cover is 12,000 euros. 
well. <laughs> Look after it safely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank sir, you. Sir, enjoy and uh, carry the conversation. My questions are ended over and out. And thank you, and back over to you. Thank you. Have we got any more questions? I, I wonder, Bob, if I might um, uh, introduce something. Uh, Gerber, I, I lost connection for a wee while, but thanks for letting me back in, Gerber. I, 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 Bob, I, I joined at the beginning of the question and answer, so I, I missed about the last five minutes of your talk, Gerber, but it was all very, very interesting stuff. I will get a copy of the book. You mentioned um, uh, Gerhard Zucker's rocket experiments in, in Europe and in Scotland. Um, I don't know if Rick Newlands is still here. Uh, Rick was a member of the Paisley Rocketeer Society, which was formed in 1936, uh, and did a lot of work with early rocket experiments using firework rocket engines and different rocket designs. I can't go into all the detail of that. Mm -hmm. But they were very active in rocket mail at the same time as Mr. Smith and many other experimenters you mentioned. And in fact, mm -hmm. Zucker's experiments in, in the Western Isles of Scotland inspired the Paisley Rocketeers. I don't think John Stewart and co. had any connect, contact with Mr. Smith, but uh, uh, John Stewart passed away in 2003, sadly, at the age of 83, uh, and his brother Peter um, handed on the Paisley Rocketeers collection, which is a very considerable collection of rockets, mail, and all sorts of other stuff to me. And included in that, in fact, was a copy of uh, the book. I noticed when you went to Baal, the pile of uh, documentation there, there was a copy on the top of the trolley on the diary of mm -hmm. the diary of Stephen Smith. I have I, I have a copy of that from the, the George Stewart collection. It's a very interesting book to read. Uh, uh, first sixty nine mm -hmm. experiments and quite interesting witty remarks. Um, anyway, the, the thing about uh, back in twenty o five, uh, the BBC Coast program, which was just starting at the time, got in touch with me and said they were aware of Zucker's experiments. So, cut really short. What I did was built a. a uh, to their commission, a full-scale replica of Zucker's rocket design of that time, but fitted it with a reliable, present-day, stable propellant, um, the type of rocket motors we use in model and high-power rocketry, which is all completely legal now in the UK. And we weren't able to get onto the island of Scarp to try and fly uh, back to Harris or in the other direction that year because of very stormy conditions. But the rocket did actually achieve the range that Zucker wanted to achieve with it on that experiment, demonstrating that the design would have been very stable, would have been fine. There was a second attempt that, that Rick uh, was also involved in as a, a range safety officer uh, two years ago, when we actually got on to SCAR, uh, 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 at, at the exact location where Zucker did his launch attempts, as you say, exploded spectacularly in 1934. <laughs> Unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, there were a few problems with my rocket. Although the rocket worked perfectly in 2005, um, uh, there were a few problems on the day of the launch, which was in beautiful weather, by the way, in, in July 2018. So the rocket took off, uh, but pitched up at a much higher angle than it should have done due to the misfiring of some of the motors. I think I know why that happened now. It took me a while to figure it out due to a shock wave produced on the launch site. Um, but the result was that it, it, it climbed higher than it should, uh, and, and, and then it plummeted, in, and so it landed halfway between Scarp and Harris, and there's quite spectacular film. This was done for the one show on uh, BBC, and there's quite spectacular oh, film, right. film it, it, I think it's still online, plummeting into the, the sea at about 200 miles an hour. But we had a boatman out there, and he recovered the rocket, and the airframe survived. The mail got rather wet, uh, uh -huh. uh, youngsters in Tarbert had produced mail to fly around the rocket. But as the locals said, at least I got halfway across this time. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that the design, so, so what I intend to do now is uh, 19, uh, 2024 will be the 90th anniversary of Zucker's attempt in 1934. So my intention is to go back again for a third time in, in 2024. If, if I wait till uh, 2034, the 100th anniversary, I might not be around. So <laughs> I, I hope to uh, continue. So the history of rocket mail is still being actively explored. In fact, Rick came up with this term about oh, this sort of thing some years ago. It's rocket archaeology. So uh, 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 in fact, what we ought to do perhaps in 1934 and then 2024 is include some rocket mail, especially made dedicated to the memory of, of, of uh, Stephen Smith and all the other rocket experimenters of that era. Uh, so that's just something I thought I would add to the discussion. Yeah. 
Thank, Thank you. you very much for sharing that. Thank you, John. Great, who's next? Who would like to ask a question? Uh, if someone's talking, uh, they may be on mute. I just, uh... And Bob and Mark, you might want to pick a few questions from the chat if you want. I'm happy oh, gosh. to. Uh... I messed stuff, right. Uh, right, so I've got a question from uh, Sovan. He's asking, uh, can you tell us more about the eight unpublished works from Stephen Smith? And is there any plans to publish these manuscripts as well? Okay, um, I'll just share something with you, um, which is, uh, is in, the, in the book. Um, this is uh, one of the few appendices. Is, is, it's all about published and unpublished works. These are the books that he did publish, and Suvan's question, I think, is about what he didn't publish. So these, uh, this list is something I've compiled from the information that uh, I came across the documents when I was looking. Uh, so he had um, a book of, mainly with illustrations about flight, and by this he's talking about uh, the... Today we're familiar with the uh, short haul or long haul schedules, well, we were uh, three months ago anyway. Um, but in the 1930s, um, India was the, the idea of having regular flights from one place to another, not only for uh, passengers, but as well as mail, was just about starting. So he was trying to catalog that. Uh, and what um, the Indian government was doing in the way of developing aviation in India, um, there was something he called Indian Airways 100 years ago. I wasn't quite sure what that was a reference to. Uh, and then this the idea of rocket transport in India, bearing in mind that he was the only one experimenting with rockets. It would have been primarily his work only. And he was apparently a bit of a twitcher, uh, a bird watcher. Uh, so he was trying to write, so he's interested in flights. And he was apparently working on a book uh, called Queer Birds of Aerophilately. So I think what he was referring to here was the kinds of birds you see on stamps, primarily. And then rocket or grams, as in telegrams, the kind of material or documents that are transported on rockets. And one that he details quite uh, at length, actually, I've seen the list of chapters that he produced uh, about balloons. It's surprising to learn that uh, you know, the Montgolfier brothers um, did their first balloon flight in, uh, in France and, uh, in, in 18, 1768. And in India, uh, balloons were flying about two years later, very early on. And then um, the last one that he talks about writing is the Indian rocket experiment, again, from pri probably uh, a compilation of the work that he's doing. But these are books that I see referenced. In some cases, a lot of detail, in some very little. And I think he wrote them. Probably didn't finish all of them, but none of them were published. So I don't know if I've answered your question sufficiently, but uh, that's the document, the, the book, books he going to, uh, that he's written, but never published. So the next question I've got is uh, from Srinivas, and he's asking, will the book, your book, be available in India? Uh, yes, you can get uh, uh, the, all the links that are on, on my website. And in fact, I have, uh, I'll share with you something else. Um, share. And in fact, when I say, ah, oh, here we go. Yeah, books are available uh, in ebook form, paperback and hardback, and they are available in India. It's a company called Pothi.com, P O T H I. And if I just share, I'll get that screen on the. Um, oh, here we go. Sorry, I've, uh, I've stopped you from sharing. Do you want to reshare? Ah. <laughs> if, if I may, yeah. Uh, so if I share that. And the reason why I want to share this with you is there are some codes, if anybody is interested in uh, 
getting a book. If you um, go to this website, the address is at the top and I'll send you the link. Uh, you can use these codes uh, and you'll get 30% discount. And if you, want, if you are in India, if you go to this website, you can get ebook, paperback, and uh, hardback. And this is on my website, AstroTalk UK. And I'll share the link after this on my Twitter feed. Great. Um, okay, I've got another question here. Um, uh, Trishikesh, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, he's asking, how did Stephen source the material for his rockets? Could you just repeat that? How yeah, did he? Exactly. Uh, how did Stephen uh, source the material for his rockets? Um, so the um, very important point here is that all the propellant, the fuel he used, he just bought from uh, a provider. So it was off the shelf. Unlike other rocket uh, pioneers, like Schmiedel, Smith did not make his own rocket propellant. He just bought it. And there were two companies in the, well, the two British companies, but they had places within Calcutta where he would buy this. Um, but the, as far as the rest of the rocket was concerned, he did it himself. He had a bit of a workshop um, and uh, he would make not only the tubes, but the aerofoils, in some cases, some of the wings, the fins and the tailplanes. Um, that's why he evolved with, uh, uh, in, in his experiments. Initially, there were paper and cardboard, but right near the end, uh, he did use aluminium because as I'm sure a lot of you rocket engineers will know, the higher the temperature and pressure at combustion, the more thrust you get. And there's only so much you can do with uh, paper and cardboard tubes. Absolutely. Um, Alex was asking, you said that we, we lost video a bit, uh, sorry, we lost audio a bit during your Arthur C. Clarke anecdote. Could you tell us again? Oh, yeah. So, uh, and in fact, um, if I can just ask uh, Pam later if she wants to share us the anecdote of uh, Arthur C. Clarke and how uh, your dad, uh, Pam, watched the film. Um, 2001 A Space Odyssey. But to answer your question, Dee, Arthur C. Clarke was an amazing character. Um, and I've known about him as a, when he was a, uh, an adult and uh, the books, science, science fiction and the science and the TV documentaries that he made. But in uh, the 1930s, when he was still a teenager, he con contacted the BIS when it was first founded and uh, um, the very first um, slide uh, that um, uh, big upon the very one of the earliest slides I shared with you, in order to raise funds for the society, the BIS produced essentially a letterheaded paper, uh, which they called members um, letterheads uh, for member communications. And to raise money, they would say, you could have a hundred of these sheets for two shillings and sixpence. And a lot of people, and in particularly Stephen Smith, he used them quite, quite a lot. And in fact, I was reading some of the newspaper reports doing my research from the Star of India. <laughs> in that uh, newspaper report, it would very often go something like, uh, and Mr. S Stephen Smith is launched, so, and Mr. Smith Brack rocket later this afternoon and so he was quite um, uh, it was not shy at all when it came to sharing the fact that he Stephen Smith was, was a member of the BIS and he showed that also by writing letters using this letter-headed paper and Arthur C. Clarke he said no he wouldn't be buying any of this because he goes through so much paper that it would just be too expensive for him to use um, do come back to me on that uh, if you wish. Um, and in the meantime, Pam, if you, if you want to share that anecdote about uh, your dad watching the film 2001 Space Odyssey? Yes. Um, just by the way, Arthur C. Clarke came to our house where I was brought up but quite a few years before I was born. So I think he was about 16 then. But mm -hmm. uh, when 2001 came out, 
we were all keen to see it, but also had promised my dad free tickets. So my mum, my sister and I went to the cinema, but dad wouldn't come with us because it wasn't that he didn't want to pay. It was more he liked the connection, that he would still be part of it. Um, their father sent him the tickets, which he eventually did, and dad saw the film. I think that's the story you meant, isn't it, Gerber? It is, and I know you've got a huge file of the correspondence that your dad has. Yes. Just from Arthur C. Clarke. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, in fact, it's, I was keeping it so safe I couldn't find it for ages. <laughs> I think you saw it in the end, did you? Because I was looking for it one day months ago and I couldn't find it anywhere. And it's because if I have something I really don't want to lose, it goes in a special place, not with everything else. And that's what happened mm. with that. <laughs> Yes. yes. Uh, lovely. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you, Gavin. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Oh, uh, yeah. To say, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Pam. Yeah. I'd just like to say thank you to Gerber for, you know, coming to our house and looking at all the information and for publishing the book that he has done and doing the next one that she's going to tell you about. Um, it's great that having got all the history in our house for such a long time, that some use is being made of it and people get enjoyment out of it. So a big thank you to Gerber again. Whitley, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, Rick Newell's here. I, I was a member of the Paisley Rocketeer Society in Scotland. And the members of the Pedro Rocketeers at the time, John and Peter Stewart, were members of the BIS. I just wanted to ask Pam and Gerber if they had any information or possible papers, possibly, uh, correspondence between the Pedro Rocketeer Society and the BIS at the time, or possibly even Smith. Well, on the um, connection between Smith and the uh, Paisley Society, I'm not aware of any. Um, although, because of the timing, I'm sure Smith was aware, uh, and indeed the uh, Paisley Society was aware of Smith's work. But um, uh, feel free to add uh, anything here, Pam. But I'm uh, I'm not aware anything of anything between the BIS and the Paisley Rocket Society. But I'm sure they will yeah. be. And that, and, and so I put that. Thank you very much for that, Rick. I think this is an interesting thread. You know, most of my writing is uh, when I'm doing something, I'll come across a bit of information which then points me into the direction of the next project. And I think this is an interesting project for, well, what are you doing uh, next week, uh, Rick? Why not pop down at some stage to the library? Indeed, have a look at the online catalogue of the BIS and see what you can find. And uh, that'd be an interesting uh, book or uh, uh, project to work on. No? Oh, it, it's I have no recollection of that. Could I just interject one brief note on Rick's question? There is in the uh, John G. Stewart Paisley Rocketeer Society collection I have here, which Peter, his brother, gave to me after John passed away because there'd be no disposition made about what was to happen to all that and nobody else in the family wanted it. Um, there is a, a receipt with Arthur C. Clarke's signature on it. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke was a treasurer of the BIS at the time John Stewart joined. And there is a receipt uh, and a short note from Arthur C. Clarke to John Stewart acknowledging the receipt of his subscription and admitting him as a member of the BIS. I think there's one or two other items as well. So that to that extent, there was correspondence between uh, uh, John Stewart and, and, and Arthur C. Clarke. And I also know that John Stewart was in correspondence with P.E. Cleeter. And I had the opportunity to speak with P.E. Cleeter not long before he passed away in 1981. Um, it connects with an exhibition I was organising at Largs at the time, which um, included, that was when I first contacted John Stewart, because he contributed rockets and, and other items to that exhibition. Um, um, the Pays Rocketeers were active again in the 19, from the 19, mid-1960s until John passed away in 2003. So there is some correspondence, but there may well be an awful lot more, so that's well worth looking into. Mm. Oh, okay. Okay, folks, I think we're coming to a natural end then. Um, so uh, all that remains to do is, is, is for me to say to Gerber, um, thank you so much for the talk today. Um, 
and, uh, and for condensing it to our strange time limits that we have for our online talks. I think you did a super job. And um, I will edit it so that um, my technical um, interruptions will be <laughs> invisible <laughs> uh, when we do the video. And um, so everybody, um, this if, you, if you'll, you'll be interested to know, so we had, uh, we had a, a maximum of 37 people on, on today, which sets a new record for our Saturday afternoon talks by, by four, I think it is. So well done, everyone. Excellent. Yeah, you've got Excellent. two for us. There's two of us. So. <laughs> Actually, actually, there's a few people with those two as well. So yes, yes, it actually shoves it up a bit more. Yeah. Um, so everybody, thank you so much for supporting our event this afternoon. And Gerber, thank you so much for the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>